This is a discussion on the implications of a study of Rashomon curves and volumes, which is the talk of Lesia Semenova. All right, so I just want to recap Lesia's talk. Um, so she's answering the following question. How can we explain the fact that for many data sets, very simple models perform well? And this is something that was noticed, you know, back in the early 90s, if, if not before that, which is that for many data sets, you can find very, very simple rules that perform just as well as the most complex uh, models that generalize for, for that data set. So how can we explain this? And Lesia has a, a, a technical explanation, a really elegant technical explanation, which is, and her, her explanation is that if what something called the true Rashomon set is large, then a simple yet accurate model is likely to exist for that data set. Okay, so let me explain a little bit of the terminology just to recap. So the true Rashomon set is the set of models, predictive models, that have low true loss. So this is the loss that, uh, you know, if you knew the whole distribution, um, these are the functions that have low true loss, okay? Um, so if you plotted the loss, so here I have the function space um, on, on the bottom, and then the loss on the vertical, uh, and the Rashomon set are the functions that have loss below this kind of um, kind of plane that I've drawn in this figure. Now, if the set of functions underneath that plane is large, that means the true Rashomon set is large. There are a lot of models with low true loss. Okay, so Lesia's point is that if the if the true Rashomon set is large, a simple yet accurate model is probably in that Rashomon set somewhere. Okay, so if there's a large fraction of good models, it's likely one of them will also be a simple model. From there, she's defined the, the empirical Rashomon ratio because you can't, um, you know, if, if you just have a data set and you don't have the whole distribution, you can't measure the Rashomon, uh, the size of the Rashomon set. So she's defined an empirical version, which is called the Rashomon ratio, empirical Rashomon ratio. It's the fraction of models that have low empirical loss. Okay, fraction of models that are good um, with respect to our training set. Now, uh, the, the again, idea again is that as long as that set is large enough, there's probably a simple model in there somewhere, okay? So if the set is large, then it probably includes models from many different machine learning methods, right? So it could include models that could arise from boosting or could be like, a, you know, a, a, it could be a weighted combination of trees or some kind of majority vote of trees. Um, there could be models in there that could be produced by support vector machines or even by decision trees. It could be uh, models that, that a decision tree algorithm produces would be maybe a lot simpler, but still could be inside the Rashomon set, just like all of these functions from the more complex classes. Okay, so the question I want to answer, uh, ask in this discussion is, you know, when did these big Rashomon sets happen? And how can we reconcile this perspective with most people's belief on, and experience with machine learning as sort of relying on neural networks. Okay, so I think the answer to that relies on something to do with data. So I think that there's a spectrum of problems and on one extreme of the spectrum are tabular data and the other stream are what I call raw data. So tabular data is where all the features are interpretable. So the data looks kind of like that. And um, these are, you know, features that are counts or cate categorical data or something like that. Now, most of the problems that I work with have data like this. So these are many different problems in criminal justice and healthcare, in the social sciences. I usually end up with data like that. But on the other extreme are the raw data where the features are individually uninterpretable. Like, for instance, a pixel in an image or... Um, a bit in a sound wave or a word in a text. If you, all you get is like, you know, a pixel or a couple of pixels, you really don't know what the image is, right? You have to kind of think of the pixels, the combinations of pixels to, to, to know that information. Okay, so these two types of data uh, lead to fundamentally different problems and fundamentally different machine learning techniques. And in particular for the raw data, neural networks seem to be um, substantially better than everything else right now for raw data problems. Whereas for tabular data, as long as you're willing to do pre-processing, all the methods tend to have similar performance. And that includes even methods that produce very sparse rules, like sparse decision trees or scoring systems, which are sparse linear models with integer coefficients. Um, 
you don't really seem to sacrifice any performance at all on the tabular data. Um, you know, even if you use neural networks, right? Neural networks have very comparable performance to, to, to decision, sparse decision trees on a lot of these data sets. Okay, so these problems are very different. And then another thing that's different is the distributions of the data. So for instance, with tabular data, if you think about what the distribution of the data actually look like, well, you know, you could take one feature and change it, and you can change it fairly dramatically, and it would still be realistic. Like you could still imagine seeing that in the database. Like if I changed, for instance, the number of past strokes the person's had from two to five, you could still think that there's a person in the database who has that, who has that set of features. Um, and you can change the features fairly dramatically and still it would seem fairly realistic. Whereas with raw data, it's not really like that. With raw data, if you go off the manifold too far, um, then you get to things that are completely unrealistic. So for instance, if I take one pixel of an image and change it, like here I've made it blue, then that image is no longer on the manifold of realistic looking images. So the density uh, is very, kind of fades gradually as you get further away from, the, from this manifold. So for tabular data, I like to think of the density as kind of blobby looking and kind of fading out gradually. Whereas for the raw data, like I said, I think the density fades out fairly close to the manifold. Now, another thing is um, not just P of X is different, but P of Y given X is, is different between these data sets. So in tabular data, um, the probability of Y given X maybe changes fairly smoothly along that, along this distribution. Um, and so that allows uh, lots of different reasonable decision boundaries to perform uh, similarly. So here, maybe this represents a sparse decision tree that would perform um, just as well as some of the more complicated, um, more curved decision boundaries. Whereas for the raw data, it's kind of different because, you know, that these images are very clearly a rose. Like for, for the medical patients, even if you had someone's features, it's really not, it's really not clear exactly what their medical outcomes are going to be. Whereas for the raw data, there are fairly more firm decision boundaries for the different classes. Okay, with that, knowing that these are different, let me go and ask some questions. The first question, is a large Rashomon set upsetting to people? <laughs> Isn't it upsetting that there's no one true model, that there's just a lot of really kind of equivalently good models, some of which are simple and some of which are more complex? Is that upsetting? Now, my answer to this is, well, I think if you're not working with causal models, it's fine. For causal models, like, you really want to know if this coefficient is positive, then that feature caused that outcome. But as long as you're not working with anything causal, then I think it's okay. So for instance, with linear models, a lot of people don't realize that linear models actually have a really big Rashomon, can actually have a really big Rashomon set. So if two of the features are heavily correlated with each other, then you can shift the coefficient between them. So for instance, if x1 and x2 were the same, I can just shift the coefficient from one to the other, and this would actually cause a Rashomon set. It's a set of models that are equally good for prediction. But as long as x1 and x2 are not, we're not trying to do a causal analysis of x1 and x2 on the outcome, then it doesn't matter which of these you use. Okay, the second question. How do you know whether the Rashomon set is large for your data set? Now this is a hard question, and Lesia has tried very, very hard to answer this, even coming up with multiple ways to measure the Rashomon set and ways to actually, um, to, to, she's come up with multiple ways, not only to, uh, to decide what the size, how the size should be measured, but also how to calculate that size. And so this is actually a very difficult question, um, but at least she found a, a, a way to kind of estimate the answer to this without having to compute it precisely. And in fact, she says, she, she found out that, um, she found an answer that's correlated with the answer to the question she wants to solve. Okay, so her answer is, you can try lots of different machine learning methods with different model forms. If they all end up giving you about the same accuracy, that probably means that the Rashomon set is large enough to accommodate solutions from all of them, which means the Rashomon set is probably large. And she says, if the Rashomon set is large, that might lead to a huge number of possibilities of things you can do with that large Rashomon set. 
So let's talk about what some of those possibilities could be. Well, first of all, as Lessia says, you might be able to find a simpler model that performs equally well as the more complex models if the Rashomon set is large. Okay, so another thing you might be able to find are models that are robust, so models that are robust under some kind of domain shifts. Um, you could also find models that may obey monotonicity constraints. Like if you want your model to increase along one variable, for instance, you might be able to impose that constraint without losing accuracy. Also, you could impose your choice of variables on the model, and you may be able to do this again without losing accuracy, because as long as that set of variables is capable of producing a model that's in the Rashomon set, you're good. Also, you could find models that have nice properties that you didn't know about before you saw them. You might be able to you know, find a simple model and say, hey, you know, I like a particular property that this model exhibits, and now I can build that in as an extra set of constraints. And I can constrain my new algorithm and hopefully produce a model that's still good, that's still in the Rashomon set. You can also have models in there that make no logical sense. But at least when you do this, you'll get a better sense of the uncertainty in modeling, because you'll understand the uncertainty that comes from the existence of this Rashomon set. I want to come back to this question of how we measure the size of Rashomon sets. And in particular, I want to know if there are Rashomon sets for raw data. And I think the answer to this question is yes. The reason why I think that is because we have found that there are interpretable neural networks that are just as accurate as the black box neural networks. Um, but of course they're interpretable. So in other words, we've imposed a set of constraints to change the model substantially, but still stayed in the Rashomon set. And then the question is, well, for neural networks, are those Rashomon sets simply much smaller than um, the Rashomon sets for tabular data? And until we actually get really a, a way of measuring the size of these Rashomon sets, it's gonna be hard to get the answer to that question. Okay, and then I guess the last question is, how can we take advantage of Rashomon sets, both for the raw data and for tabular data? What else can we, can we do with these Rashomon sets that we don't already know about? Thanks.